Did you know that somewhere inside your body is a hammer? And even an anvil and a stirrup? Although you would expect these things to be found in a horse stable, you can actually find them in your middle ear. The middle ear is an air-filled cavity found between the external and inner ears. The hammer, anvil and stirrup, also known in medical language as malleus, incus and stapes respectively, are the three smallest bones of the human body. They form a bridge between the eardrum and the inner ear, which makes possible transmission of sound from our surroundings. So you can imagine that in the case of inflammation in the middle ear, your hearing will most likely be affected. And this is exactly what we're going to talk about today, the inflammation of the middle ear, also known as a titus media. To help you understand this disease best, we're going to cover it in a systematic way. First, we'll define it and give you a brief overview. Next, we'll discuss its pathogenesis, which is the explanation of why and how the disease develops, as that will help you make sense out of the next part, which will be the most common symptoms. Then we'll finish up the video by describing the diagnostics and treatment. So without any further ado, let's begin with our first part, the overview. The inflammation of the middle ear is in medical terminology known by the term otitis media. I know, sounds pretty odd, right? But when you think about where the word came from, which is the Greek word oto, which means ear, a suffix itis, which signifies an inflammation, and media, which comes from Latin and refers to the middle, it doesn't sound so odd after all. Otitis media is one of the most common diseases in children. It can be acute or it can develop into a chronic form. The most frequent version of otitis media is its acute form, so that's the form we're going to focus on today. Otitis media usually occurs when an inflammatory process spreads from the upper respiratory tract into the middle ear. How does that happen, I hear you ask? Well, the answer lies in the anatomy of the middle ear, so let's briefly highlight its most important parts here. There is a small tube in our mouth that spans between the middle ear and oral cavity. You might have heard about this tube, as it is called the auditory or eustachian tube. It is partially made of bone and partially made of cartilage, making the tube not terribly flexible. The auditory or eustachian tube enables the ventilation of the middle ear, allowing for the air in the middle ear to travel to the oral cavity and vice versa. Why would this be important? I can hear you asking. Well, the pressure of the air around us can change due to various factors. For example, climbing up a mountain where the pressure is low or descending down where the pressure is high. Generally speaking, when the pressure of the air around us changes, our eardrum is affected, with high pressure pushing the eardrum inward and low pressure pulling it outward. The eustachian tube enables that new air to enter the middle ear, resulting in the equalising of the air pressures in the middle ear and your surroundings. This is a really important function of the eustachian tube as it prevents the eardrum from tearing. You've probably noticed this process while ascending or descending while riding on a plane. Those odd sensations of clogged ear, change of hearing and popping sounds in your ear are actually the product of pressure equalisation in your ear. So the eustachian tube is very helpful, right? However, even though it helps us preserve our hearing, this tube also provides an anatomical passage for pathogens into the middle ear, as we mentioned earlier. In fact, acute otitis media usually follows an infection of the nasal mucosa, nasopharynx, middle ear mucosa or eustachian tube. Acute otitis media is most frequently caused by a certain microorganism, while sometimes it arises due to exposure to certain allergens. The majority of cases are caused by bacteria, such as Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenzae, and Moraxella catarralis. Viral agents are less frequent, and they can be respiratory syncytial virus, influenza virus, parainfluenza virus, rhinovirus, and adenovirus. Certain factors can increase the likelihood of a child or person developing acute otitis media. Those include congenital malformations of the structures in the middle ear and around it, as well as exposure to tobacco smoke. Congenital malformations are alterations in the structure and or function of an organ that are already present when a child is born. When the pathogens colonise the middle ear, they cause inflammation in it. One of the features of any inflammation is edema, 
or swelling of the affected tissue. And given that the eustachian tube is a non-flexible and narrow canal, the edema quickly obstructs the patency of the tube. Obstruction in the tube then prevents through it the normal ventilation of the middle ear. This alters the pressure in the middle ear, causing fluid to come out of the surrounding mucosa into the middle ear cavity. In these conditions, bacteria and viruses can thrive and cause the first symptoms of the disease. The most common symptoms of acute otitis media usually include irritability, sleep disturbances, hearing difficulty, pain in the ear, fever, and fluid drainage from the ear. But especially in infants and young children, the symptoms might not present that clearly. They can show gastroenteric symptoms like stomach cramps, diarrhea and vomiting instead, and if they haven't yet acquired language, they are often seen touching the affected ear to signal their discomfort. The symptoms usually last between three and five days, after which the otitis media usually resolves spontaneously without any consequences. However, in some cases, it can be associated with a varying degree of hearing loss as a result of permanent damage to the middle ear structure. More so, the infectious process can sometimes be spread to adjacent anatomical regions such as the cranial cavity and mastoid process and cause more serious inflammation. Because of these potential complications, it is necessary to monitor the patient until it's certain that the disease is resolved. Monitoring will also allow experts to adjust the therapy in a timely manner if necessary. The otitis media is diagnosed by an otorhinolaryngologist, a doctor specialised in the diseases of the ear, nose and throat. This disease is usually diagnosed through an examination of the ear with a device called an otoscope. In cases where there is a suspicion of developing complications, imaging studies such as MRI or CT are usually performed, as well as blood and smear tests. The primary goal in therapy is to alleviate pain. Therefore, medications from the group of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and acetaminophens can often help. In the UK and the Commonwealth, the NSAID most commonly used is ibuprofen. Acetaminophen is more commonly known as paracetamol and is often sold under the brand name of Panadol. In the US, the acetaminophen brand you may know best is Tylenol. Proper hydration and rest are also required to help the body recover. If there is a reasonable assumption that the infection is bacterial in nature, antibiotics may be prescribed. However, due to its nature of spontaneous resolution, doctors will more frequently just treat the pain, given that unreasonable application of antibiotics plays an important role in developing resistance to these drugs. While these complications might occur, they are very rare, and if you follow your physician's prescription and advice, you should be on the way to a speedy and full recovery in no time. Thank you for watching. This video is part of KenHub's limited clinical series and is for educational purposes only. It does not provide medical advice and none of the information in this video should be used as an alternative to a medical exam, specialist diagnosis, nor treatment. If you're feeling any health disorder symptoms, please contact your doctor.